I have had some fits with this wireless microphone, I guess, since I've been here. That's all right. We'll get it work. We'll get it all sorted out. I appreciate everybody's uh, willingness to both attend and to help in the lock-in on Friday night. I know that I had a great and exhausting time. Um, they, they love playing hide-and-go-seek, and I've learned they're really good at it. So if y'all find a little kid hiding underneath your pew, tell them the game's over and it's time to go home, okay? Uh, no, we had uh, nearly 50, I think, was our final number, which is a lot of people <laughs> to stay up all night. And uh, every time that we do a lock-in, I ask myself one simple question the, the next day. Why do we do lock-ins? Why? But no, I'm, I'm reminded of the wonderful times that we had. Had a great time to learn some good Good things from God's Word to grow closer together and to grow closer to Him. The sin of hurry is probably one of the least talked about sins in Scripture. It's because a lot of times when you think about sins, you think about something that is specifically laid out as saying, Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not do this or that. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't... uh, uh, bear false witness or, or worship another God before me. Those, of course, are Old Testament laws that laid very plainly out for those who were under the Jewish law system to not break the specific commanded laws from God. And other laws are simply implied, or other things are simply implied. Coupled with the laws of not put, putting other things before God is not necessarily giving the list of everything that you could put in front of God, but rather that anything that comes between you and God is seen as idolatrous or is seen as breaking of the law. And the reason why hurry is, is often overlooked or missed is because we're all sometimes in a hurry so much that we forget that some of these things that we do or some of the practices that we possess within our own lives become sinful or become wrong or come between us and the Father. And you might go, okay, so what does this have to do with our worship? I, I thought we were doing some series about the different things of worship. I'm going to give us a little break. Every, at the end of each part of our series, if we go four or five sermons, I'm going to mix it up a bit, keep it a little bit fresh. So next week we're going to start talking about prayer So I'd encourage you to be studying up on that topic as we jump into that together. But the sin of hurry is one that is, like like I said, often overlooked and often missed because it's something that that just seems so normal or so a part of our lives that we don't see it as being something that could be hurtful, being something that could hinder us from being better servants of God. I want us to look at a few things this morning. I'm I'm a statistics guy, even though it's a hard word for me to say apparently. I like statistics. I like looking at numbers because numbers tell a story. Now, I'm not good with numbers, so I'm not good at math. I'm not saying that by any, by any means. But I like looking at the fact that you can track certain um, uh, types of, of things throughout life by looking at how many or how little people or how often people do something or involved in something. And so we're going to look at a couple of statistics or look at a couple of things that kind of point us in the direction of seeing why this sin of hurry is such a big problem within our lives. One of the coolest names that I have ever heard in my life is Corey Ten Boom. And Corey Ten Boom is quoted as saying, If the devil cannot make you sin, he will make you busy. Because the devil knows that if he can make you busy enough to focus on the things of this world, that you'll stop focusing on the purpose of why we are on this world. The devil knows that if he can make you to focus on all the things that fill up your life and fill up your schedule and surround yourself with all these places that I've got to be and put so many irons in the fire, that that means that he can pull your focus away from focusing on Jesus and and the Father. That he can pull your focus away from doing what the things that God has set for you to do. So he knows that if he can simply make you busy, then he can separate you from the Father, which is his ultimate goal. I want us to notice that our attention span as, as a creature, as, as humanity, is lower than it has ever been. A recent study has shown that the attention span of humans has decreased down to eight seconds. Not minutes. Seconds. Eight seconds. Now you might think, ooh, Case, that's horrible. <laughs> that's bad. Some of you aren't even thinking what I just said because your attention span ran up a few seconds ago and i got to get you back for a second. That's all right. Eight seconds. Now, to make matters worse, not only is eight seconds bad uh, bad enough, a goldfish's attention span is nine seconds. 
And don't ask me how they found that out, because I have no idea how to test the attention span of a goldfish. But a goldfish, something that you have probably had 30 of in your life, can pay more attention to me than you can is more able to tone out the things of their environment and focus on one thing specifically than we as humans can now. Why is that the case? Because slowly but surely we have filled our lives with so many things, allowed for our minds to be filled with so many things that we begin to drift into all different kinds of thought. And I will promise you, I am one of the worst at this. And hurry is coincidentally becoming one of the worst problems that we face because of this attention span. Well, I've got to be here at this time and here at this time and tomorrow I've got to go here, here, and here and then I've got to make sure that I talk to such and such and call up such and such and be at work from this time to this time and while I'm at work I've got to do this project and that project and don't even mention school and the kids and soccer and, and football and you know, ballet or whatever it is that you fill your lives with. Don't even mention all those other things that continually draw our minds away from our focus of what it should be on this earth. And what that does is slowly but surely makes our attention span worse, makes our relationship with God worse, and spreads us further and further from the truth. I mentioned that we're going to look at a couple statistics. A recent study has shown that hurry, as, as hurry increases in your life, as hurry becomes more prominent within your life, it begins to affect your life negatively based on your productivity, the friendships that you possess, your health, your physical health and mental health, your children, your relationships, including your marriage, and of course, most importantly, your faith. The more that you hurry, the more things that you fill your life up with, and it seems like a pretty simple formula, the less that you focus on the things that you were meant to be focusing on. Every time that I do something else, every time that I add something else into that puzzle or into that piece of life, I'm drawing myself further and further from the people who I love and from the God who I serve. And as a result, I am hurting myself and those who are around me more and more. Y'all like tests? I don't. I really hate tests. I'm a horrible test taker. I can take good notes. I can read and I can get something that I need to know. But the moment I take a test, I forget everything that I've studied. I'm horrible at it. That's why I have notes for when I preach. Because I'll forget everything even though I've, I've, I've dove into the scriptures and looked and drawn these things out. If I don't write it down, I'm going to forget it. That's just how my brain works. I don't know why. But we're going to take a test this morning. This test is called the restlessness test. We're going to list eight things, and I want you to picture within your own mind, or maybe make a, a mental note, if these ten things are present within your life. The first one is irritability. Any of you ever get irritable? I, I, I say it up with a lot of you on Friday night. Yes, I know everyone at the lock-in can affirm that this one is true. What about hypersensitivity? It's kind of coupled with a little bit with uh, irritability. What about restlessness or emotion, excuse me, or workaholism or emotional numbness or putting our priorities out of order or creating a problem or a lack of self-care or experiencing escapist behavior or slipping on our spiritual disciplines, the things that we put in place within our own lives to allow for us to have a more structured spiritual life. Or maybe it is simply isolation. If you suffer or have any of these things within your life, you have what is known as restlessness. You have what is known as the sickness of hurry. Now, I've gotten better First time I went over these statistics and the first time I studied for this topic, I had about eight of these in my life. Uh, and that's horrible. That's really unhealthy. Uh, and I've gotten better. This number's still higher than I'd like it to be. But the more that you hurry, the more that you fill your life with, the more things that surround your heart, the more that these things creep into your life. Restlessness, workaholism, Emotional numbness, hypersensitivity, irrationality or irritability, a lack of self-care, escapist behavior. These things are not healthy within any relationship that you possess. And so you could very quickly understand why this would be unhealthy for one to practice these within your life. 
If I know that something is actively affecting the relationship that I have maybe with my spouse or with my children, with my parents, or with my church family, or most importantly with my God that I serve, that I am supposed to serve, then I need to eliminate whatever it is that makes those relationships to not be as God has designed them to be. And that thing that causes these things is hurry. Is seeking constantly to gain more and more or seeking constantly to have other things in your life. I mentioned that this sin of hurry is the worst thing for all these, all these things here. You'll notice that each one of these is important within our lives and therefore should be given enough attention. And therefore our lives should be focused on serving God and on helping others to get to heaven. And if all these relationships are affected deeply, um, then very quickly we should understand that we need to eliminate the thing that affects these relationships in a negative way or these things within our life within a negative way. The, the, the strange part about hurry, however, the, the strange issue that we face with hurry is it's, it's a lot like other issues, but it's got its own unique problems. One of which is being that we normally don't notice that hurry is a problem until it's too late. I know that from speaking with my, my parents, one of their biggest regrets in life is that they kept us busy when we were young. You know, going to sports or scouts or church events, which is a good thing to do. Um, but all these different things with the, the PTA meetings and the, all the different things at school and all the social events and making sure that we were at movies at the Martin on Friday night to hang out with our friends. All these things that they were running to and from uh, with us. They said their biggest regret is that they didn't spend more time with us as a family. That we were so busy with so many other things, we forgot to spend that time together. And so many of us maybe can consider or think back to moments in our lives that seem to have flashed by uh, without a blink of an eye or within a blink of an eye. And you realize, what happened? Where did my time go? Uh, where was all those moments that we were supposed to share together? Where were all those opportunities that we were supposed to have together? Well, they got so wrapped up in everything else that we were doing. Your life became so consumed with so many other things that those things that were meant to be important to you drifted off to the side. Seemingly, we wish our lives away from us. I know that when I was five, the only thing that I could think about was being 10. That was the coolest thing in the world to me because, that's, hey, that's two digits. I don't even know why that's important to me. But when I was five, it was two, two digits in your age. That's awesome. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. And then when I was 10, you know what I started wishing for? Man, I wish I was 13. Isn't it cool to be a teenager? They get all this freedom, they get all this cool stuff, they get to go hang out with their friends. And, and then when I was 13, you know what I started thinking about? Man, you know what's really cool? Being 15, you get to drive a car, that's awesome. And then I was 15, it's like, man, I'm ready to get my, my mom or my dad out of this passenger seat so I can be 16 and drive by myself. And then when I'm 16, I'm thinking, you know what? Oh, man, it'd be cool to vote, I get to, to buy a firearm, or, or even better, I get to go out and drive without any restrictions whatsoever when I'm 18, and then when I'm 21, I get even more freedoms from all those laws that were placed on, on me when I was 18, the restrictions with driving, so on and so forth, and now I can buy a, a handgun and, and go and, and rent a car, and then I, I can be 25, which was my personal favorite so far, because my insurance about got cut in half, so that, that one's great, really look forward to that one if you're not 25 yet. When you're 25, it's like, man, I, I get my insurance cut in half, and then before you know, you go, wait, wait, where, what happened? I was, I was just five. I was just 10. I was just, I was just 13. I was, I was just 15. I was, I'm 25, 35, 45, 85. What happened? Where were those moments? Where were those memories that were supposed to be made? Where was that time that I was supposed to have shared with my family? Or those opportunities that I was supposed to take, those places that I was supposed to see, the people who I was supposed to meet, the chances that I was supposed to take, and the, the life that I was supposed to experience. What happened was, is that we fill our lives with so much hurry that we wish our lives away. We're constantly seeking for the next thing. Our attention span stops focusing on what is present and what is active and what is there, and we begin to focus on what is to come. We focus more on what we desire in the future rather than what is there for us in the first place, what is present with us in that moment. We have allowed for the things of this world to overtake our attention so much that it has overtaken our lives and made us busy, and we have made busyness our idol. The thing that is spoken so greatly of in Scripture as being a problem, which is idolatry, 
has become the thing that plagues us as Americans more than anything else that we face. When you look at the things that you face and go, well, Case, that doesn't sound like business. What put us in that situation? What led us to that moment? What allowed for this thing to come in between us and God? Hurry and busyness. Now, here's the interesting part. We've identified that maybe, maybe hurry's an issue, a problem. Maybe it's something that you're sitting in the pew going, man, he's, you know, he's really kind of talking to me today. Trust me, I, th- these lessons that you think, hey, that's a good thing for us to study, it's hit me in the heart before. That's why I'm talking about it. It's because I've maybe noticed a problem within my own life. Maybe a problem that needs fixing within my own life. The interesting part about this solution is that like many problems that we face in, in life, the answer is provided for us in Scripture. Go ahead and open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to spend just a moment there before we begin to dive a little bit more into Jesus' life. Jesus offers us a solution to this hurry. And you might go, well, it doesn't seem like it. He only says something about it maybe in one or two verses. Well, you'll notice very quickly that that's actually not the case. Jesus practiced the separation of himself from hurry many times throughout Scripture. We just might not see it because we don't study Greek a lot or we don't look into the original text a lot. Because that opens up a whole other door for us to see how Jesus helps us to solve this problem. Understanding that Jesus is not just our Savior, but our guide through life to salvation is very important for us because you'll notice that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11 that He gives for us a way out of this hurry. And it might not be the solution that you think it is. It might not be the way that we think it is. Notice what He says in verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, when I was growing up, when I read this passage time and time and time again, do you know what I thought this passage meant? That if I just put everything on God, that I'm not going to have to work anymore. I'm going to take a spiritual or a physical vacation. Now, I like vacation. I like traveling. I like going to see new places, especially when I get to do so with my wife. But most of the time what happens on, on, on my vacations is I sleep a lot. Because I don't normally. <laughs> and so on those weeks that I'm supposed to be seeing some beautiful place, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a nap. I'm trying to catch up, if you will, on sleep. And instead of even enjoying those moments that we're supposed to have, separated from our normal lives and uh, separated from the, the moments that we have, we find ourselves, even some of us find ourselves still working. Can't put the thing down that, that controls our life, that we still keep focusing on that thing. Notice what Jesus says here, is that the solution to restlessness or to hurry is not to just rest. It's to learn a new way to work. Notice what he says. Come to me, all you who, are, who labor, who work, and are heavy laden, and I will give unto you rest. Or I will give you rest. Notice how he says he's going to give us rest. It's not by taking a nap. It's not by uh, uh, reorganizing your schedule and making sure that you have a little bit more time for this, that, and the other. Notice what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says the way that you find yourself out of hurry, of restlessness, it's not by just stopping everything that you're doing. It's by learning a new way to work. It's by learning that in order for me to navigate through this life, in order for me to push on, in order for me to continue to do the things that I need to do while not becoming restless, it means that I have to put my burdens upon him. I want us to notice another passage here this morning. Look with me at Luke chapter 9, verse 57 and 62, through 62. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 through 62. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said unto him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but go and preach the kingdom of God. And another, he said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When you look at this passage, a few things should pop into your mind. One should be the motivation of your own life. My life should be so dedicated to God that I would sacrifice anything in order to serve Him. But but sadly, the second thing that pops in my mind is that this seems to have become less of a description of, of my service to God or my service to others 
and more of a description of the things that fill my life other than God and other than serving others. When I look at maybe my, my, my work or my hobbies or any kind of thing that I'm involved with within my life, these descriptions have become less of, of what our service to God is and more so of our service to other things, our service to idols, if you will. Instead of sacrificing so that I can serve God, I sacrifice my service to God so that I can serve other people or other things. Instead of separating myself from the things of my work in order to focus on my day of worship, I focus or separate myself from my day of worship in order to focus on my work. Instead of separating myself from the things of this world or, or maybe the people of this world in order to worship God, I separate myself from the people of this world in order to do my job. Or instead of bidding farewell or saying goodbye to those who I love because of my service to God requires for me to do something else, I find myself uh, sacrificing those relationships that I have in order to serve the God of hurry or of busyness, in order to serve something that has now taken reign over my life. Instead of, uh, instead of looking to, uh, to Luke chapter 9 and seeing an example of what it means to be a true servant of God, instead of looking at Luke chapter 9 and seeing what it means to be a true follower of God, what I see time and time again is, is the example of what it looks like when others place something else before God. They give up the relationships that they have. They give up following after God. Instead of picking up their plow and following after God, they lay it down to track after something else, to follow behind some, uh, something else. When you look at this, this is at the root of a lot of the problems that we have. Let's say that your problem that you face is greed. So how, what's your solution to greed? Well, in order for me to get more, maybe I have to work more or work harder. In order for me to work harder, I've got to maybe miss some birthdays or miss some special events or miss some time with my family. In order to get certain things done, I'm going to have to, to uh, give up some certain things in my life so that I can gain that thing that I'm seeking after. So that I can obtain that item or that possession that I am seeking after. And before you know it, the God that we have replaced our God with is the God of hurry or of busyness. The God that we are worshiping is not the true God of, of this world, but rather is the uh, idolatrous idols or, or idolatrous little g gods of this world. I want us to focus on a word that Jesus introduces for us. And I know that we don't have quite much time left together, but I want us to focus on a word for just a moment. The word is eremos. I mentioned that his solution is given to us not in English most of the time, uh, but is given to us in Greek. This word eremos, it's, it's the word that means uh, deserted or desolate or wilderness is, is sometimes that we see it. And you'll notice there's a few, there's a few I'm actually going to go forward and back a little bit. There's a few places that this idea is mentioned um, in Scripture. If you'll notice, and I'd encourage you to do so, to, 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 to take notes uh, on these verses, because we're not going to have time to look at all of them, um, uh, unless you want to be here till midnight, uh, which we can be as well if you'd like. But we've already done that this week, so we'll, we'll hold off on that. Looking at this word, Eremos, you'll notice that each of these places is actually a moment where Jesus Eremoses, or Jesus takes a moment to Eremos. And this means that Jesus finds himself in a position where he separates himself from others. Whether it be before or after he receives the news that his dear friend, that his colleague, that his co-worker in the faith, John, has, has been killed, has died. He separates himself. Whether it's the moment after his baptism, which we see in Matthew chapter 3, you'll notice as, as he goes into the wilderness in chapter 4, he goes into the Eremos. And before the Satan or before the devil ever appears to Jesus within the wilderness, you find Jesus praying for 40 days and 40 nights. And I've always looked at, at the, the, that moment of temptation of Jesus in a very weird way because I think that when I look at that moment where Jesus doesn't eat for 40 days, I think that that probably makes Jesus weak. Do you want to know why I think that? Because that would make me weak. Because I'm human. So was Jesus. But instead of focusing on that hunger, you know what Jesus was doing for 40 days? He was praying to the Father for 40 days. Where was Jesus the night before his crucifixion? He was in the garden, alone, Eremos, praying to the Father. For what purpose? Gaining strength. Building himself up. Regaining the thing that he had lost due to the... Uh, uh, work that he had done previously. 
So when you look at Matthew chapter 4, don't just think that Jesus is just super weak because he didn't eat for 40 days. Jesus has just meditated and spoken with the Father for 40 days in prayer. Jesus is strong. And that's why when you see the devil appear to Jesus, he begins to pick little by little at those places of weakness that he is seeking to find. But Jesus has just spent 40 days in prayer. When I feel the most rejuvenated, when I feel the strongest in my faith, you know when that is? When I've just prayed. Or maybe when I've just worshipped and offered up prayer as part of my worship. Jesus just spent 40 days praying to the Father for strength. And now he faces these temptations. And he, he, he simply just answers, have you not read? Or as it is seen in Scripture, as some translations might put it. He's focusing always on the Father, rather than on the things of this world. So that when those things that the devil brings forth as temptation, those things of this world, when they appear before Jesus, he's not weak, he's strong. Stronger than he's ever been. And he faces those temptations with great strength. All throughout his life. But after you see, almost without fail, and I'm holding my hands up because I'm not crossing my fingers, because to the best of my knowledge from what I have seen, almost without fail, when you see Jesus do some big, triumphant, glorious thing, almost without fail from what I have seen, Jesus immediately removes himself from that place and enters into a place of eremos or of desolation or of quiet. He removes himself from that, that great amount of work, places himself in a place of, of uh, desolation or of alone time and he prays to be rejuvenated and strengthened once again. So what does the word eremos or maybe other places in scripture that mean alone or separated or a place of seclusion or a focus? What do these things teach us about our problem from hurry? The solution for hurry is not to just stop working. The solution to hurry is not to just quit or to give up, or to have a mass exodus as we have experienced these past few years from the things that fill our lives, the solution to hurry is, is taking a moment of your life to separate yourself from the things of this world and put on that yoke that Jesus speaks of in Matthew chapter 11. Go to the Father in prayer. Take the problems that you face, the issues that you struggle with, and place those burdens upon the Father but keep going. Don't take a week off or a month off or a year-long sabbatical. Simply take a moment, pray for strength, remove those burdens from your life, and move forward. Keep pressing on. Don't allow for that idol to control your life and separate yourself from God. Jesus, in those moments where he needed rest, took time to rest. And if Jesus who had the most important job on this earth, can take a moment to rest and pray, but notice those two are coupled together, to rest and pray, then we have a, an opportunity to do so as well. He provides for us an opportunity to do so as well. I want us to focus for the last few moments this morning just on that, that problem that we face of hurry. I want you to remember back to those symptoms that we mentioned of the sickness of hurry. That restlessness, that workaholism, those struggles that appear within our lives, those things that separate us from God. And ask yourself the question, is the thing that I am serving more than serving God, is it, is it really that important? Is the thing that I have allowed to introduce itself as a wedge between the relationships that I have with my friends, or with my family, or with my spouse, or most importantly with my God, is it really that important? Is that task or that job that I've got to get done and it seems as if it's got to be done right now, is it so important that it's worth me risking the relationships that God said are essential within my life? Is it worth maybe my soul or my heart or my mind? Is it worth my focus? Is it worth me putting so much effort into in order to sacrifice the things that are truly essential? Is it really worth it that much? I hope that your answer would be that no, it's not. I'm not telling you to go and quit your jobs and quit the PTO and take your kids out of ball and scouts and all that stuff. But I'm simply saying, don't get so lost in these moments in life. Don't get so caught up in the works of this world that we allow for it to become our idols. 
Because there's going to come a time when we don't have that time together anymore. When we aren't able to experience those relationships any longer. Those kids, they grow up. Those parents, they get older as well. Those moments that you have that you can look over and see uh, the youth within your spouse's eyes, they will slowly disappear. Those moments that you can stand up without making a really loud noise and grabbing your back, those moments go away as well. And before you know it, your life is over. That vapor is passing. And instead of hurrying your life away, worship your life away. Work together as Christians to serve God and do so with all of our hearts. Use the, the life that God has given you for a purpose. Not just to put so many irons, irons in the fire that you wish your life away or work your life away. The solution that Jesus offered for hurry is, is separating yourself from burdens and putting them upon the Father, putting them upon Him and continuing to work in a way that glorifies and gives honor unto Him. This morning, maybe you need to separate yourself from your burdens. Maybe that burden isn't that you work too hard or that your life has become so consumed with other things. Maybe your burden is simply that you have allowed for sin to become the thing that comes between you and God. That sin has become your idol. That sin has become the thing that separated you from the Father. God offers us a solution for that as well. Not just casting your burdens on Him, but casting your sins on Him. Putting Him on in baptism, cleansing yourself, and allowing for that sacrifice that He offered on the cross to be brought into your life and given unto you as a way of separation from that sin. Or maybe it's the case this morning that you've put on Christ in baptism and what you need is repentance. Maybe you've become so filled with the other things of your life that you've forgotten your true purpose is to serve and worship Him with all that you can do. We can help you to eliminate hurry from your life. We can help you to eliminate sin from your life this morning. All that we ask that you do is that you lay those burdens upon the yoke that is guided 